bill which effectively appoints judges with transparency, with merit, and with integrity. Regrettably, today, the way in which this bill has been passed doesn't inspire confidence. The Constitutional Amendment Bill was passed in the Rajya Sabha without much debate, without no debate. The Judicial Appointments Commission Bill has been referred to the Standing Committee. In the Lok Sabha, the Constitutional Bill would have been passed without so much of a debate, but for the fact there was a technical error. Now, the public is not consulted. We, the members of the bar, have had no chance to rep make a representation. I am told that today they, there is a notice that all suggestions should be made to the chairman of the standing committee of the Rajya Sabha. Somebody can take note of that <coughs> and a proper representation <coughs> is made well and good. But today, there are many points about this system which requires serious consideration if you are to accept it. Is the composition of this commission, Judicial Appointments Commission, something which we must accept? Now, strangely enough, in the United Kingdom, which is the best example of a working Judicial Appointments Commission, I have not seen it. At the High Court level, it consists of 15 commissioners. And the majority of them are lay persons. There are about five judges. The chairperson of that was a lady of Indian origin, Baroness Prashar. And it has unquestionably worked very well. Can we have that system here? Perhaps not. We can't trust lay persons to appoint judges. Majority of them, they are subject sorts of influences. For the appointment of judges in the United Kingdom for the Supreme Court, which is the equivalent now of the High Court uh, of, the, of the House of Lords, they have another select committee consisting of the, the President, the Vice President, the Chairman of the Judicial Appointments Commission of Scotland, Wales, etc., and few other persons. And they select persons. And they select the best persons. And what, how do they do it? There is an open invitation. Persons who think they are competent enough to be judges of the Supreme Court or the High Court, they apply. Their application is considered. And the Judicial Appointments Commission considers. Let me tell you the example. There was the, the most famous QC in England, the man with the highest income, highly respected, man called Jonathan Sumption. He wanted to give up his practice at the bar and become a judge of the Supreme Court. When he applied for the first time, that, that selection committee did not select him and selected somebody else. Nobody raised a protest about it because the other persons who were selected were also competent. Maybe they were not so well known, etc. Jonathan Sumption applied for the second time and this time he was appointed and today he is a member of the Supreme Court of UK. Now this sort of an open system by which you can apply by persons whose application is considered, they are interviewed, transparency, do we, can we have the system here in India? And this is the most important point today. If you see the to the amendment bill, the appointing of the commission, they say that this particular, how is to be worked out, it's not mentioned anywhere. But there is a section 8 says, the commission will pre prepare a short list. How is the short list to be prepared? I'm asking myself the question. You have thousand, over 1,500, 1,000 judges of the high court. You have 31 judges of the Supreme Court. And who will shortlist the vacancies for the high courts? They say the shortlist will be prepared by regulations under the, by the commission. Will the regulations be of such a character that you will shortlist the right persons? Nobody knows in the matter. 
And this Judicial Appointments Commission consists today of the Chief Justice, two judges of the Supreme Court, the Law Minister, two eminent persons. And one asks oneself a very question, is this not a full-time job for a country like India to have a Judicial Appointments Commission with so many judges? Can the Chief Justice and two judges of the Supreme Court spare time from their judicial duties to day after day consider the merits of the applicants and appoint them? How can you then have this sort of an ad hoc system? It has to be a regular Judicial Appointments Commission of the highest character. Not that the Chief Justice and the two judges are not, but simply they will not be able to do the job. That's why in England you have a full-time judicial system, Appointments Commission. Similarly, in South Africa you have it, but the Constitution requires that. But this sort of an ad hoc measures of will, will not do. Therefore, and the point was rightly made this morning, if you are to appoint judges, there must be some consultation with the bar. Now, this suggestion was made that the president of the Bar Associate of the Bar Council of India should be appointed. That the law minister declined. And perhaps for good reason, because there's no guarantee that the person who is elected as the president of the Bar Council of India necessarily is the competent man. But there must be consultation with the bar councils, either the state bar councils or by the central bar council, because they are the persons who are the most competent in the matter. Now, all these are going to be a matter of detailed regulations. And can we therefore today say that the present system, present bill, is something which is to our liking? Now, cons just consider this. In the United Kingdom, they have separated the Judicial Appointments Commission for the High Court and for the Supreme Court. Why can't this be done here? There must be a different Judicial Appointments Commission for the Supreme Court and a different one for the High Court. Then only can you do satisfactorily this work. You can't have for a country of this size a Judicial Appointments Commission which is working ad hoc. The bill says the person who will summon this meeting will be the person who is called, somebody who is called the uh, con controller or whatever it is. But nobody knows when this, will, uh, bill, uh, will this committee will be meeting. There has to be a permanent body and there should be, therefore, uh, all the time, all these things have to be done. Now, therefore, at the end of it, the other important question is this. Today, the bill says we will appoint even the Chief Justice of each High Court and the Supreme Court. This is the most ticklish point today. We go mechanically here in the appointment of Chief Justice by seniority in the Supreme Court. In consequence, we have sometimes the spectacle of a Chief Justice who is for six months, as, as Chief Justice Kirpal was, Chief Justice Baruja was. We have a Chief Justice only for less than one month, Justice Rajendra Babu. Sorry? 18 days. K. N. Singh was known as for 18 days. The next Chief Justice who will be there will be only for five months. Now, is the Judicial Commission competent and will it have the strength to say that we will bypass the seniority and appoint persons who are the most competent persons for the Chief Justice of India? In Australia, they have appointed Chief Justice French, who was not a member of the High Court. High Court is the Supreme Court. And he comes from West Australia. There's not a murmur of protest because the man is competent, there's no doubt about that. Chief Justice Roberts of the United States Supreme Court is appointed. The rest of the eight judges do not quarrel about that. Ultimately, the Senate approved of it. Today, he's one of the most competent men. At the age of today, 50, he is now the Supreme Court judge of the United States. Is this commission also competent enough to bypass this so-called rule of seniority and appoint the right persons for, chief, for the Chief Justice of the High Court or the Supreme Court. 
And why should the Supreme, why should we have the system by which a judge, a senior most judge of, this, of the High Court must necessarily be transferred? Why should they, uh, have we the system by which a Chief Justice can't be the Chief Justice of his own court? Chief Justice Chagla, one of the finest judges which we have ever had in Bombay, he was offered the Chief Justice of the, as a Supreme Court. The Supreme Court judges, of course, did not like that. But Chagla on his own said, I would prefer to be the Chief Justice of my own High Court rather than to be a judge of the Supreme Court. You don't allow this today. Now, all this requires serious consideration. Today, we, long and short of it is, we have come to the stage when we can't accept the collegium system. Sometime back, before this bill was introduced, we, members of the Supreme Court Bar, Associ Bar Association of India, thought we would write to the Chief Justice to say that, please remedy the defects in that. Now, that may be too tall an order. Perhaps today, the collegium system is conscious of their defects. But today, when this bill is being introduced, when Parliament is seized of it, it is incumbent upon us, persons who are knowledgeable, to take up this issue and take up the issue before the bill is passed in the Lok Sabha so that the remedy bills can be properly remedied and we have a system by which we can be satisfied that the judiciary, at least in one aspect, is remedied and we have the right judges. Thank you very much. May I request my good friend Krishnamani to give his address? That came off, went off well. Mr. Ashok Desai and my other friends on the dais and my dear brothers and sisters. The Andhi Arjuna was saying about different systems in the world, which one we will adopt. He was placing each one before you. <coughs> but no system will work unless the people manning the system are clean and they are above all and they are great. Then only it will work. <coughs> Whether this is collegium system or judicial commission, appointments commission or the executive, I know of one thing. Even when the executive was exclusively in charge of appointment of judges, in one matter where we were appearing for a shipping company in Madras High Court, we had argued the matter and for six years judgment was not given by the court. And because foreigners were involved in the matter, they were writing nasty letters to the advocates. Then, we went to the Chief Justice who had reserved judgment. We went to him and told him that this is what the client has written. For six years you people have not given judgment in this matter. Six years. Then the Chief Justice, Justice Veera Sami was the Chief Justice at that time. Whatever may be said about his integrity, but uh, as a judge, he was very efficient. He used to dictate even constitutional validity matters in open court within 15-20 minutes. He had great grasp and I have never seen a competent person like him anywhere. We went to him, we asked him, he said, no, no, within few months, that person who did not write any judgment and kept them reserved, he was elevated to the Supreme Court. <laughs> that was the reward. I don't want to. You can find out after. Talk to, uh, you, can ask him things. you can ask him after the lecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Positive things, I will mention the name. Negative things, I will not mention the name. 
you can easily find out it's not very difficult a person with a positive outlook it will be difficult to find out who he is but a person with a negative character you can easily find out that is not a problem so it happened in those days before 1993 long before 1993 therefore you cannot say this system is better the executive system mm. even in that wrong people were appointed even in the present system collegium system wrong people are being appointed you will be surprised to know that one judge of the supreme court had a farm house near chennai and advocates used to go there his brother was looking after the farm house but it belonged to the judge and one person used to come and serve them coffee serve them tea give them water open the door close the door and one fine morning he was a judge of the madras high court <laughs> therefore in this system no nobody bothers about the background of the candidate why because there is no transparency in the system therefore we do not know who is being appointed and uh, suddenly they announce that uh, so and so and then we only attend the ceremony of swearing in ceremony and then they they come and sit one judge we had concrete evidence against him he was caught red handed when he was functioning as an office bearer in the supreme court bar association <laughs> he admitted his guilt and paid that money saying that he misappropriated wrongly one day he was appointed as a judge of the high court here in uh, delhi it was challenged no no just before that it was challenged by, by the time the matter came before the court president had signed they said you, you can go only for impeachment then he was appointed therefore system is bad because of the people manning the system whichever system it is whether executive whether commission therefore what we have to do we have to lay down the criteria for appointment for the post of typist in the high court or in the supreme court or in the lower court there are some norms there are some requirements that he must type at least so and so words in one minute or one hour but there is only one post for which no nothing is prescribed only minimum qualification is he must be a human being that is the post of a judge of the high court and supreme court <laughs> nothing is prescribed anybody can be appointed only 10 years should last from the date of his enrollment up to the date of consideration of his candidacy for appointment as a judge these are the things which are responsible for the system collapsing what is the purpose this is bhagavati was saying 186000 cases are there in the supreme court and the entire system is collapsing but then what happened when justice vangata chaliya came as the chief justice some marginal measures were taken in the supreme court nothing big we he, he discussed with us we agreed that we will work up to 4:30 instead of 4 o'clock then mondays all the judges were going home around 11:15 to 11:30 so that was stopped and they were given some additional work with such marginal measures we were able to bring down the arrears to 29000 appeals in the supreme court therefore it is not very difficult even to find good candidates if you analyze the method of appointment in other countries there are different methods but in most of the countries they are advertising the post most of the countries they are asking for applications in most of the countries applications can be recommendations can be given by the bar association 
Bar Association can send a list. Anybody can send a list in, a, in another uh, constitution. Anybody can send a, send a list of people or one person you can recommend. And they have to find out once criteria are laid down, we don't require human beings to check them. Computer will check. Then filtering will be very easy. Maybe 3,000 people apply, but then it can be easily filtered and then brought down to just 300. Therefore, these are the methods. But then in India, there is a hue and cry. So many areas are there in a very high court. Uh, and then even the law commission recommended in nine, 1968 itself that the judges uh, proportion to the population that has to be modified into 100 is to 1 million. They recommended. Now it is only around 12 or 15 is to 1 million. But then by increasing the uh, post, what, what will you achieve? In the National Consumer Commission, you come and see. Earlier we had only one bench with the five judges. Justice Eradi used to preside over. There are Prembisha also came. But then today, you are having six benches. So many judges sitting there. But then nothing is moving. No final disposal. Very hardly, very few final disposals. They just, you can't see anybody, not even a fly after 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. This is the way we function. What is the purpose of increasing the number of judges? Another question. There are about 960 posts of uh, judges at the high court level. 960 and dot. Always more than 300 posts are vacant. They don't appoint. In Allahabad High Court alone, always 80 vacancies are there.